So today's Enter Live uh, will be with Aaron Bambra, a good friend and former colleague of mine. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about the newest species of bee to Britain. So Aaron, over to you with the tale of the ivy bee. Thank you, Kieran. And hello, everyone. And thank you all for coming this evening. It's so nice to see so many people coming on a nice sunny day like this. Uh, so I'm Aaron. I'm a PhD researcher from the University of Birmingham. Um, I didn't always used to be that. I, I actually started my sort of entomological career off with the FSE Biolinks project, which um, Kieran used to manage. Um, and just uh, full disclosure of this, when I, I first agreed to do this talk, um, I was just about to start my PhD. And I was looking for topics that I could talk about. And I was convinced that I was going to end up doing something on the Ivy Bee. Um, so I, I thought I'd do a whole chapter on it. But that didn't actually pan out um, as with things. Things move quite quickly in research and, and that didn't happen. But it's always been a species that I've been very interested in. Um, and I've always wanted to talk about it. I could talk about it uh, forever, really. So I thought I'd use today to, to give you guys a sort of informative overview lecture about this species and, and why it's so interesting and why it's so fascinating to me. Um, so um this species has um oh, sorry let me just go to the next slide so this is the ivy bee this is coletes hedere and um, over the past decade this unassuming little bee has caused quite a stir in the world of entomology and um, this one species has turned our traditional understanding of how insects colonize new landscapes and new territories on its head and it's also revealed some very interesting developments in how we think about the number of bee species that we actually have in Britain. Um, and that's due to uh, genetic, um, new, new findings in genetics. So this talk will address some of these new findings and it will reveal the tale of the ivy bee, one of the most interesting species in Great Britain um, and one of the newest species to colonize our country um, over the past few years. And it's important to know that actually all of you today, hopefully have heard of the ivy bee. Um, and that's actually quite a unique thing um, that so many people could be so familiar with a, a solitary bee species because there aren't many solitary bees out there other than say maybe the tawny mining bee or the ashy mining bee that other people, that, that members of the general public and sort of non-entomologists are familiar with. But this species seems to, to have become a household name and in like 20 years as well. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable. So uh, let's have a little little discussion about this. Before I get into the nitty gritty of it, I wanted to just give a brief sort of overview of the taxonomy of the species, just for anyone who's potentially not in, uh, familiar with um, with bee taxonomy. So um, bees are arthropods um, and they belong to the class Insecta, so they're insects. And this means that they're animals with jointed appendages, they've got hard exoskeletons and they have segmented bodies. They also have uh, six legs. So bees belong to the order Hymenoptera, um, and it's the large, one of the largest orders of insects in the world. Um, and currently about 115,000 species have been described globally. And the word hymenoptera literally translates from ancient Greek to mean wedded wings. So hymen meaning wedded and uh, terra meaning wings. And this is a reference to the fact that the wings of, of organisms in this group have uh, four individual wings or two pairs and they're joined together by these little tiny hooks that we call hamuli and um, other orders of insects, like say the diptera, they, uh, they're, they're flies and they only have one pair of wings, so two individual wings. So the number of wings can actually tell you which order of insects you're looking at. And for bees, they're in the hymenoptera. Um, but within this order, uh, bees belong to a super family called the apidae. And what, what really is a bee? A bee is a pollinating machine. It is a vector that enables plants to reproduce. Um, and they're excellent indicators of environmental health. Um, and the reason for this is because they're intertwined very, very closely with other different kingdoms of life, most notably plants. Um, but they're also ecosystem engineers, just in the same way that worms and mayflies and human beings are, in that they, uh, they terraform and transform their environment, which can actually lead to greater diversity for other organisms. So they're pretty cool things. So within the superfamily Apidae, there are five subfamilies of bees in Britain. There's actually six subfamilies worldwide, but only five in Britain. And these are the Melitidae, so the Melitta bees, or also known as the Blunthorn bees. Only have about three species in Britain. Then you have the Apidae. Uh, this is a bit confusing because the superfamily is called Apidae as well, but this is a subfamily as well. And the, the subfamily Apidae has social bees, it has nomad bees, it has a whole mix of social sonotry. It's a really big family in Britain. Then you have the Megachilidae, and these are your sort of your aerial cavity nesting species, like your leafcutter bees or your mason bees or your scissor bees. Um, and then you have the Andronidae. So the Andronidae is probably the group that most people are familiar with. They are the mining bees and they're the biggest um, genus of bee that we have in, in Britain and, and the biggest family. Um, and 
they, they often emerge in the spring. Um, they're quite colorful little bees. And then you have the Coletidae. So the Coletidae um, is, is a really fascinating family and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And there's a sixth family called the Stretinod, Stret so I always get this word on, Stenotritidae. Um, but they are only found in Australia, so we're not really going to talk about them too much. So the ivy bee is a species within the Coletidae, and it's a diverse and interesting family of bees in Britain. And it tends to get little attention in comparison to other different groups um, until quite re recently, really, until the ivy bee has sort of made people turn their heads a little bit. Uh, but this family, the Coletidae, is where the genus Coletes gets its name from. Um, but it also contains other, other, other genre. Um, so there's another genus called Hylaeus, the yellow-faced bees. Um, which look very, very odd looking bees. Um, but it just shows that this group is very diverse and there's lots of different types and forms in Britain. So Coletes bees are often actually called plaster bees. Um, and this is because they're capable of coating the inside of their nesting cells with a waxy plaster-like substance that is similar in both consistency and um, in terms of its chemical structure to paraffin wax, which is pretty crazy when you think about it, um, something that they produce from their bodies. Um, and why do they do this? Well, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later on because it's, it's a really fascinating section on its own. But members of the Coletidae, they're solitary, they're medium sized bees. They've got short tongues. So different bee species have different tongue lengths. Bumblebees um, and social bees often have quite long tongues, whereas uh, solitary bees can tend to have short tongues. And the size of the tongue often um, mirrors the flower that they're trying to get the nectar from. Um, and ivy bees are pale haired, usually quite fluffy, and they've got banded abdomens. So this family is comprised mainly of subterranean um, species, so species that nest underground, but there's also cavity nesting species as well. And all members of the genus Coletes uh, nest underground. So this is a near cosmopolitan genus with about 500 described species worldwide. And in Britain, there's only nine species within the genus Coletes, and that's quite nice for us because it means we can study it very well. So the great thing about Britain is that we kind of have a slice of the world, um, and because of that, we've been able to study it um, in a really in depth way, often more uh, comprehensively than other countries. And that means that we know a lot more about our natural history. Um, but these species are quite, can be quite common and widespread. So there's a Coletes davisanus, um, which is a, a type of species which is quite spread, widespread. You get it in parks and gardens all over Britain. Whereas other species are very rare and they can, can be confined to coastal areas or where there's a very particular plant like sea aster. Um, and they can only be found in association with those areas. So they tend to be quite rare. And all members of the Coletes, they share a similar morphological diagnostic feature. And this is just basically a way of saying this is how we know that this bee is part of the Coletidae. And that is that it has a bilobed tongue. I'll just pop this in here. You can see the little bilobed tongue um, on this Coletes uh, bee here. So it just means two forks, effectively. Um, and all members of this group have, have this tongue. The ivy bee has become one of, the most, one of the exemplar species for this genus, and almost everyone has heard of it. But where do ivy bees actually originally come from? So ivy bees are a common and widespread species in continental Europe. Um, they're found in Austria, Belgium, Croatia, France, including Corsica. They're found in uh, Germany, Greece, Italy, Sardinia, Luxembourg, uh, the lowland countries like ne the Netherlands, Serbia, Slovenia, Spain, and even Switzerland as well. So they're found pretty much all over Southern and Central uh, Europe. Um, and it was not a species that was known from Great Britain historically, um, but in 2001, it was actually first recorded in Dorset for the first time ever. Um, and by 2016, this bee had spread across Southern England and South Wales, northwards and eastwards to colonize most of East Anglia, the Thames and Severn Valleys, uh, the species is now well established in Wales, in the south of Wales as well. Um, and in 2014, it was actually recorded in the north of Wales too. So it basically colonised all of Wales in, in a very short period of time. And since the 2016 season, there's been an expansion northwards with new records from Nottinghamshire, Yorkshire, County Durham, including Whitburn and Southern Cumbria. So the species is moving into northern England and establishing itself with many different populations and assemblages in that part of the country. Um, and the Bees Wasps and Recording Society, so you'll hear me talk about this organisation quite a lot today, they are a national recording scheme that compiles data on lots of different types of hymenoptera, but mainly Bees Wasps and Ants. Um, and they create these distribution maps that enable us to, to track the spread of the species. But they also create some fantastic species profile web pages where you can learn about individuals so you can get resources for the IVB and how to identify it and where to find it. Um, so they're a really interesting and, and valuable resource. 
So uh, they create these distribution maps um, and you can get, get these on their website. And the species was in, in the distribution maps from the Bee Wars data, uh, the species was shown to be confined to southern England in early 2009, which is the left hand map. Um, and so that's quite an old map, really, 2009 is ages ago. Um, but the most updated distribution map that Bee Wars have available on their website only shows the species distribution in 2016. And that's the map on the right. So there isn't actually an updated distribution map for this species. Um, but for this talk, I thought I would actually update the distribution map from 2016 to 2022. Um, just for you folks, you get to see it for the first time ever, um, you lucky, lucky people. So this is the most updated distribution map for the species in Great Britain, and you guys are the first to see it properly. Um, so since 2016, new records show that the species is extended into Northumbria and potentially beyond this, as the data displayed in this map is up to the end of 2022. So when we get this year's data, for 2023, um, obviously the IVB will emerge in September or onwards. When we get that set of data, it might show that it's even further north throughout Scotland as well. So from its first record in Dorset in 2001 to its last record in Northumbria in 2022, I calculate that this species has been traveling northwards at a rate of 14.41 miles per year over a 22 year period. It's pretty quick. Um, I live in Birmingham and I saw these bees for the first time ever last year in my garden. I'd heard about them for years, but I'd never actually seen them until last year. And I wondered whether it had anything to do with the hot weather that we were experiencing. We had these little pockets of, of a seasonal drought last year. Um, and I thought that it might be interesting to see whether um, the drought has essentially affected this species and whether there's been a surge of records during drought areas. And one of the things I was quite uh, interested in uh, you guys um, answering was, did you see the IVB for the first time last year? And if you did, where? Um, if you could pop your um, comments in the chat, at the end I'll go through and read it. It's just something that interests me to see whether the, the hot, hot prolonged um, droughts that we had has, has impacted the species' distribution. So we've had a little discussion about the history and the basic taxonomy and biology of the IVB. Um, but let's have a look now at the feeding and nesting ecology of this really remarkable species. So ivy bees, as you probably have already guessed, they feed predominantly from European ivy, which is a uh, helix hetero. And this is what actually gives the ivy bee uh, its, its actual name, so Coletes hetero. So females collect pollen for their offspring from ivy and nectar at the plant during late summer and early autumn. This emergence time is very late for a solitary bee, as most species tend to emerge in early spring or summer. The reason for this is that they have to time their life cycle with the flowering of ivy. So you're looking like late August to early October, depending on where you are in the country. How do they do this? It's a little bit unknown, uh, but scientists believe that bees and flowers have a very special relationship and they rely on one another for survival and reproduction. So scientists believe that these, that flowers and bees have ex are extremely sensitive to changes in temperature and, and that this actually allows them to synchronize their emergence. Um, and you can understand from this perspective why us messing around with the climate and, and affecting, um, you know, causing seasonal droughts and things like this could actually lead to a lack of synchronicity between plants and pollinators, which could cause dire consequences throughout the food, food chain and, and the rest of the ecosystem. But the late emergence times of the IVB make it the last bee species to actually emerge in the season. Um, so it emerges and it's very active when most other bees are sort of uh, are ending their life. Uh, for the year. And Coletes hedera is a monolectic bee. Um, and I'll talk about these terms. Also. It's a monolectic, oligolectic. These are actually terms that refer specifically to the feeding behavior of bees. I'm not sure if it applies to other invertebrates as well, but I know that it's, it's very much used in, in the world of bees. And what oligolectic or monolectic mean, it, it, uh, they're referring to bees that specialize on collecting pollen from a very narrow range of plants. So often um, species from a single family, uh, or genus in the case of oligolectic, or um, in the case of a single species, we would call that monolectic. So these are highly specialized bees if they're if they're feeding from um, a single a single uh, plant. So pollen is collected for the developing larvae, whereas the nectar provides a rich source of sugar for the adult insects themselves. Um, and ivy bees are not active for long. Like most bees, they have a succession and they're they're sort of around for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and then they they teeter off. So they emerge in September and they may stay active for a few weeks, depending on the weather and weather and how that affects the flowering period of the ivy itself. But what do they do with this pollen and where do they nest? So these bees create dense nesting aggregations underground in chambers in sandy, light, friable soils. 
And let me tell you, the nesting aggregations for these, this species in particular are absolutely enormous, probably the biggest in the world. So in any solitary bee nest, you'll have a main tunnel. Uh, if you look at here, you've got this sort of this lovely um, image that was created by my colleague and friend Dan. Um, so it's uh, you have this main bright tunnel that goes down into the soil and it can extend up to a metre underground. And then coming off this main tunnel, you have these little lateral tunnels or branches. Um, and at the end of each one, you have a little a nesting chamber. And inside that nesting chamber, there will be an egg um, and it will be stacked with pollen and a bit of nectar. Um, so although in, in, in this instance, that nesting chamber will be stocked with uh, the floral oils and nectar and pollen of ivy. And although there may be thousands of individual ivy bees at a nest site, they are not social. And so each individual mother bee has her own chamber with her own specific offspring. Um, and once a chamber has been created, it is sealed up and closed off with an excretory substance produced by a special gland of the abdomen of the ivy bee. And we call this gland the defors gland. And this is a remarkable organ. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Males tend to outnumber females um, around nest sites, and you can actually find lots of males inspecting burrows of, of females. And a study in 2005, um, I don't actually think I've shared this from the UK, and so I'll, I'll send you the link afterwards, but a study in 2005 found that female ivy bees in Germany will utilize, utilize old nests and that some nests can extend between seven to 20 cent, 12 centimeters horizontally at a depth of about 30 to 45 centimeters. So they can go quite far down into a substrate and they often like cliff edges, south facing sloping banks, and it has to really be sandy and friable and soft and nice to burrow into. So you may remember that I called ivy bees plaster bees and um, let's explore a little about what this is and, and why, why, what the relationship uh, this, has, this has to nesting on. So have you ever actually wondered how a bee is able to keep its eggs and larvae buried underground, protected from bacteria and fungi and uh, all sorts of viruses and other kinds of infections? Because they leave their eggs in, underground for long periods of time throughout the course of a year. Well, it's achieved primarily through um, this gland, the defors gland. And this is a special or organ located beneath the sting chamber of the female insect. And it's able to produce a protective casing that encapsulate the bee's chamber and the larvae and protects it from the elements. It's hydrophobic, antifog, uh, antifungal, antibacterial. It's a really remarkable substance. And all bees possess a defors gland, but in the Coletta day, uh, this gland is it's spectacularly large. I mean, it's like it's on steroids. Um, it's the largest of any bee in the world. Um, and the above image that Dan also produced shows the defors gland on a helictid bee. So this is, if you like, a normal bee. And you can see the little blue defors gland here just below the sting chamber. So that's a normal helictid bee. This is the defors gland of a colectid bee. And as you can see, it's absolutely ginormous. Um, it almost takes up the entire area of the abdomen and the sting chamber. And it's really unclear as to why colectid bees have this extra large defors gland, but perhaps they evolved in environments which required them to have an extra layer of protection for their offspring. So it could be that they, they evolved in really humid, wet environments where there are lots of parasites. And so having a really protective thick layer uh, as enable them to protect their offspring. Um, and the size of these glands may actually play a role in the success of the IVB. So it might enable the species to nest in areas that aren't traditionally part of its range. Um, and I just wanted to add uh, on this as well, that they used to think that the gland, the, the casing that the gland, gland creates stops things from getting, at, uh, getting in. So it stops um, all sorts of nasty uh, parasites and whatnot getting inside the chamber. But they actually showed uh, quite recently that the, uh, the protective casing stops water from leaving the uh, chamber as well, and that stops desiccation. So the insects are actually able to, in their larval form, they're able to hydrate themselves directly by touching the water. So their cuticle directly absorbs the water. And so the casing not only keeps stuff out, but it also keeps the good stuff in. Really remarkable stuff. So species identification. So the ivy bees are fairly easy bee to identify and recognize, mainly due to its size and its flight period. And it's got these really strong abdominal bandings. High quality data can be generated for this species by members of the public. And, and that's essentially the reason for this talk as well. It's to try to get as many people as possible to go out and record this species, because you can make a really uh, significant contribution to, to science uh, by doing so. So let's take a close look at some of the diagnostic features of this bee. So of the nine species of Coletes in Britain, there are three species which can all look quite similar. Um, and these three species include Coletes heterae, the IVB, Coletes succinctus, called the heather Coletes, and then Coletes halophilus, which is the sea aster 
calices. And they're referred to as the succinctus group. So they're, they're referred to this because they all look very similar, but they also all are extremely related. And it wasn't until um, 1993 that scientists described the IVB as new to science from specimens which had been previously thought to have been Coletes halophilus. So they had historically identified it as one species. Scientists went back to historic collections. They looked at the species again. They did some genetic analysis um, in 1993. And there's a paper that Kieran can pop in and chat about this. And they actually found that this, this one species was actually another species. And that was that's the birth of the ivy, if you like. And it's a really brilliant thing that we can find new insects to science. Um, you know, you often think that all the low hanging fruit has been picked, but there's all this that we still don't know about the environment and about um, insects in particular. And, and we can make massive contributions by looking a little bit more closely at even historical data. So there are key differences, however, between the ivy bee and the other two species which are easily recognisable. So first, let's talk about size. The ivy bee is a large bee. It's about the same size as a honey bee, sometimes larger. The other two species are, are a bit smaller um, and they also emerge at different times of the year. So the flight period of Coletes hederae is between the end of August and the end of September, and no other bee is as active during this period as the ivy bee. Coletes succinctus, the heather Coletes, is a bee which specialises on heather and so will only be active from June to August when heather's in flower, and it tends to only be found near a heathland. Coletes halophilus is a very rare bee. It's called the sea aster mining bee. It's got an oligoelectric relationship with sea aster, so you only find it in, in coastal areas where you have sea aster. So if it's mid-September and you're looking at a big patch of ivy and you see uh, an interesting looking Coletes bee land on it, and you're not sure whether it's the ivy bee or the heather Coletes or the sea astamine bee, think about the time of year, think about where you are in the country. Um, if you're massively inland, you're not going to be catching the sea astamine bee. If you're nowhere near a heathland or any heather, you're not going to be getting Coletes succinctus. And the big thing really above all of this is that if it's found, if you're finding this organism, in this bee, sorry, in autumn, then it's going to likely be the ivy bee. As with all bees, females are typically larger than males. Um, they are very hairy. Both males and females possess a rich orangey coat of hairs on top of the thorax. This is a very orange bee. It's got um, orange hues throughout its entire body, including its abdomen. The sides of tergite one, um, and we call tergites ab abdominal bandings, we just call that in the bee world, and they have conspicuous orange buff side hairs which cover the top and both sides of the thorax of, of the abdomen. So you can see those little, that little patch of hairs there is a really good, useful identification feature. You don't need to take a specimen, you, you can do it from a photograph. I've got dreadful vision and I can see these when they're on ivy bees on, on my ivy. So you guys shouldn't struggle at all. They're, it's a very clear feature. And if you look at this, this uh, dead specimen here, you can see them really nicely. These lovely little patches of hairs that sort of come equidistant from the, on the top tergite. Um, and yeah, they're very, very pretty little bees, quite fluffy. Um, for anyone who is um, interested in taking specimens of bees, the way in which you differentiate between different coletes can be worked out by looking at the puncturing and the shininess of the tongue. And I just thought this would be quite interesting to show you guys. So this is the tongue of, of um, of a Coletes, and you can see the shininess and the punctures. That's actually what you're looking for when you're trying to uh, examine these bees under a microscope. Um, so Stephen Fork's Flickr account provides an excellent resource of photos to help you move through the key. Um, and uh, as Kieran will put the link in now, Stephen Fork's got a fantastic Flickr site. It's got tons and tons of photos, both um, of individual species when they're alive and on flowers but also species that are dead specimens um, that you can look at in a bit more detail. So I'm going to put a little, little quiz here. It's more just a, can you spot the IVB? And you can, you can either put an answer in the chat or you can just answer to yourself. What do you think about this one? Is this one an IVB? Give you a few minutes just to have a little think about that. Brilliant. So this one. Yeah, we're getting a lot of a lot of answers in. I'll just give you a second. So we've got a lot of no's and we've got some definitely nots. Oh, brilliant. So people are very, very sure of themselves on this one. Okay, so this one isn't the IVB. Well done. What about this guy or gal?
So, Aaron, the results are coming in. We're getting a lot more no's again. Yep, yep. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so this no, one no, no, isn't no. this one isn't an IVB, but it is a coletted B. I threw it in there just to confuse you. It's not. What about this one? Is this an IVB? It is. Brilliant. So the reason why this one is an IVB is you can see pretty clearly the orange hue on the top of the thorax. It's extremely furry. It's got the banded abdomen. Really strong, clear, distinct bands on the abdomen. I mean, you don't get many bees that have it that beautifully clear. And these are all the, these, there's lots of hairs on these bands. Um, it's not just the cuticle, it's actually a very hairy insect. And also, if you look real close, you can just see this little foxy hair here. And that is how you know it's the it's the orange hairs on the first turbite, and that's how you know you're looking at the OB. What about this one? And so this one confused me for a second. Is this an OVB? We're getting a lot of no's, Aaron. Brilliant. So this one isn't the OVB, you know, this is a male Andrina of sorts, got a nice little fluffy face. What about this one? Is this an IVB? Probably yes, yeah. it's coming in. Yeah, lots of yeah. yes. So this one is an IVB, and again, you can see the orange hue, and you can see the banded, the banded bits on the abdomen. Fantastic. So now I know you guys know how to... Oh. Now I know how you got you guys know how to um sorry my sound is just gone. Hearing, can you still hear me? Yeah, yes, here. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm gonna have to take these off because my sound has just gone in my headphones. Sorry about that. Okay, um so let's move on now to the next section. Oh well, sorry, this question before you move on, what was the being in what was the second B? You said it was this a one, this one. It's a type of coletes. It's a, it's um, uh, I'm not entirely sure of the species, but it's a type of coletes that's not an IVB. I don't think it's. Oh, it's um, canocularis, coletes canocularis. There's another coastal species, and it comes inland into sand dune systems. But it's a, it's a beautiful little fluffy bee, and that's a male. Okay, so. Let's move on to the next section. So we have seen how IVBs have spread very quickly into Britain and continue to colonise northwards into new areas. Uh, and this section of the talk will discuss what factors might be influenced in this range expansion and why it's happening and whether the arrival of the, this new bee in Britain will actually have any implications for species which already live and nest here. So why are they here? Why is it that a species prior to 2001 that had never been recorded in Britain has suddenly over the past 20 years experienced a huge range expansion in Northern Europe. Although Britain is an island, we are closely tied with the fortunes of species in Northern France, Belgium, the Netherlands, the Channel Islands, and Germany. You may not have noticed that I have not called the ivy bee a non-native or even an invasive bee. And this is because naturally occurring colonizations do occur with species over time. So the bee and wasp fauna of Britain is fluid and flexible, and it can change from year to year as some species go extinct or are lost due to habitat destruction and other species expand their range into new areas, and they become part of the new fauna. Colonisations and extinctions of species from Britain over time may have happened periodically throughout Europe, um, and this is because climate and landscapes change across the continent. So Din and Sadler in 1999, in their analysis of the Holocene entomofauna of the British Isles, found that the ecological, climatic, and human-induced modifications to the landscape of Britain result in the loss of 44 species of invertebrates from mature woodland, wetland, and grassland. So as, this, as our country has changed both climatically and due to habitats over time, it's meant that we've lost lots of species. But in the same vein, we've also gained new species as our country has become more hospitable to them. There are two key factors which may explain why the IVB has expanded so far north so quickly, and these are temperature and climate change and their feeding ecology. So let's chat a little bit about climate change and temperature. Um, it's a very, very hot day today, and it's probably one of the hottest ones we've had in a while. But if you think back to last year, it was an extremely warm period of time. Um, all insects are stenotherms, they're stenothermic, and this means that they have a very narrow uh, relationship, they have a very sensitive relationship to temperature, and a very, very narrow gradient from which they can actually exist, temperature gradient. And early studies on how temperature impacts larval development in ladybirds in the 20th century 
laid the foundation for understanding how insects are impacted by rising temperatures. And in these studies, researchers found that increases to the incubating temperature of ladybird, ladybird eggs resulted in the faster development of the, of the adult, of the larvae. So in many species, temperature is thought to have an influence on the speed of larval development and even the number of generations a species can have per year. Voltanism, it sounds like something else, Star, Star Trek, but it's not. So voltanism is a term used to describe the number of generations an animal has per year. And in insects, uh, this can be impacted by changes to temperature. Um, Univoltine bees are species which have a single generation, so uni, one. Bivoltine bees have two generations. And multivoltine is a term referring to any bee that has three or more generations per year. Hotter seasonal temperatures um, may result in some species moving from univoltine to bivoltine flight periods across their entire range, or even just in the southern parts of their range. So in Britain, you actually get some species that in the north, in the north or in the Midlands, they're univoltine. We only, you only see them once a year. But in the south, they're bivoltine or multivoltine. So you, you lucky southerners get, get to see lot, a lot more um, generations of insects because you've got a hotter climate down there. So temperature not only impacts the larval development of the offspring, but it may also influence the adult insects during their flight period. So hotter, longer seasons may mean that there is a greater period of time from which an adult can fly and facilitate greater opportunities for them to actually move into new areas. Um, but has Britain been getting hotter? Seems a silly question, really. I think everybody knows the answer to. And I think everyone in Britain should see this, this graph because it's quite alarming. Um, this shows the UK's mean average annual temperature between 1884 and 2022. So basically since the start that the, of the Met Office monitoring in Britain. And the Met Office has the oldest weather and meteorological records in the world. So Great Britain has experienced some of the hottest, driest weather ever recorded in the country over the past decade. 2022 was the hottest year on record in Britain with an average uh, annual temperature of about 10.03 degrees Celsius. And, and that exceeded the previous hottest record, which was set in 2014 with an average of 9.88 degrees Celsius. This is the fact that I find most astonishing, but the 10 hottest years on record since Metaphoris monitoring began over a century ago, all occurred after 2003. So we've been getting gradually hotter and hotter, and then we've reached this point where things have just been getting stupendously hot and they seem to be exponentially growing. Although this data only shows mean annual temperatures, it is very likely that hotter autumnal and winter seasons over the past 50 years has contributed to the IVB success in Britain. But what happens to temperature sensitive animals like bees when things get hot? Coop, in his 1995 study, proposed that historically there are three possible scenarios related to a species response to regional changes in climate. And I'm going to talk you through these now. So the first one is adaptation to new conditions. You'll have an organism, it gets a lot bit hotter, it starts to change its physiology or its ecology to adapt to that condition, and it can survive by doing that. Then there's migration to more suitable areas. That's the second one. If a species can't exist in an area because it gets too hot or it gets too uncomfortable or there's not enough flowers for it, it will move. And if it's, if it's heat that it's controlled by, it will move to cooler areas um, if it's getting too hot at the end of its range. And then the third and final one is extinction. If a species can't respond uh, flexibly enough, if, it, if its uh, phenotypical plasticity isn't strong enough, then what will happen is it will just go extinct. Um, and you will lose a species from a country, a region, um, an entire continent. Um, and that has happened countless times throughout history. And according to Hill in his 2002 study, in a changing climate, species in the northern part of their range will contract to higher elevations as the southern parts of their range become climatically unsuitable, whereas species in the southern part of their range should expand northwards into new suitable areas. So you have this sort of mix around of species where one area becomes just unsuitable for them because the climate's too hot, they leave to, dip to cooler climates, and then that leaves a gap where new, which, which, speak, which the cooler species then move into. So this year is even worse. Um, sorry, think of how uh, hot Britain was this time last year um, and how much more unbearably hot southern Spain or Italy would have been at the same time. Um, and if you're a bee and you're in that part of the, of the world, you will be flying as far as you can to get away from that heat and ending up in, in Britain. So this year is even worse for continental Europe than last year. Um, but we have avoided much of the, uh, much of the extreme heat. 
So temperature-induced range expansions have been documented in several insect species over Britain across the past 20 years, and these are just a few of them. But there's a study led by researchers at the University of York, and they analysed over 20 million records of 300 different insect taxa in Britain, and they determined that many generalist species are expanding northwards. So the Roselle's bush cricket, once a species confined to the southeast coast of England, has undergone a massive range expansion into central and northwestern England, um, passed into, into Leicestershire and further north. Um, and one of the reasons for this could also be uh, the fact that um, motorway, uh, the grass, the grassy verges of motorways, they could be moving up through that. The emperor and migrant hawker dragonflies, they've increased um, their range by 17 to 28 metres per day over a 40 year period. So that's, that's extremely large, but it's nothing in comparison to, to this one. The harlequin ladybird, so we've all heard about the harlequin, it's an invasive species, colonised in 2004. Um, it trans Bit sexually transmitted diseases to other ladybirds and it eats other ones. It can be a real menace to our native species. But it has moved through all of England and is now colonising Scotland and it is travelling at a rate of 100 kilometres per year over the first four years of its establishment, which is just absolutely remarkable. But my favourite species uh, for this is actually a species that I found last year for the first time in the West Midlands. And this is called the, uh, the noble jewel wasp um, or hedicrum nobil. And it actually colonised Britain in 1998, very similar to the IBB actually, it colonised Britain in 1998. And it's since moved northward into Birmingham in the black country, into Staffordshire and Shropshire and Nottinghamshire. And I calculated it, it was travelling at a rate about 10 kilometres per year over the past 20 years. Um, and it's it's a beautiful, beautiful wasp, um, and it's a very common sight in heathlands and sandpits all over the West Midlands now. Um, and I've actually just written and published a paper about this species in the British Entomological and Natural History Society Journal, which is a fantastic journal and a great organisation. So if you're not a member, definitely sign up. Um, and uh, just a little shameless plug, but maybe maybe for season three of Ento Live, I could come and give a talk about this lovely insect. Um, but it's really, really quite a beautiful species. So climate change may help explain why the IVB colonised Britain from Europe, but it does not necessarily explain why the species has been so successful here. One reason may be down to its feeding and nesting ecology. So you may be asking yourself, does the presence of the IVB in Britain have an adverse or negative impact on other bees? Um, the answer to this question may help explain why the species has been so successful. Often in cases where a species colonises a new area, it may fall into competition with existing population for nesting and foraging resources, which are already quite limited and dwindling. There's also the increased risk of the new species introducing pathogens and parasites to the existing populations. So think about, say, um, the, uh, how the Europeans, uh, the early conquistadors and colonialist Europeans transferred diseases to South Americans and indigenous peoples in Mesoamerica um, 200 years ago. It seems that the IVB has had a negligible impact on existing populations of bees. And this is primarily due to the fact that the IVB has occupied an ecological niche, which no other bee actually currently occupies. Um, and this is because they're late emergers and they're not coming into conflicts with other bees that are also active at that time because there's not really any out really. And um, because of this, there seems to be little competition for nesting sites. And also the fact that the, that the IVB feeds predominantly and solely on ivy means it's not clashing with other species for forage, which is a huge problem um, in, in terms of the fact that there's not enough flowers to go around really. However, truthfully, it's far too soon for us to say with any kind of certainty what the true impact of the IVB is on British bees, because it's just too soon. Um, the story is quite similar to the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum, another recent colonist, which seems to have fit quite nicely into Britain's fauna without disturbing other species. So now I've been waffling on about all this, um, and I hope it's kind of made you want to try to record them and go out and, and learn a little bit more about them. And the monitoring of the IVB has been one of the most successful citizen science projects that bee wars have, have ever run. Um, and a significant proportion of our current data for this species comes from members of the public submitting sightings. Uh, so people like yourself who are interested, who have taken the time to educate themselves, who go out and contribute data. Um, and it's one of the things that makes this country so fantastic is that we have citizen scientists, we have lots of volunteers that go out and make huge contributions to science. Um, the Bee Wars website has a page dedicated to reporting sightings of the IVB with a literally a simple online form that you can fill out to submit your data. Um, Kieran will pop the chat for this now. Um, but there's also some um, other links to materials about the IVB, its distribution, how to identify them, their ecology. Um, the data that we require for record includes the who, so the recorder, the what, obviously the species of the IVB, 
where did you find it, the location? It'll either be a grid reference location, sometimes it has a vice county number, and when, what was the date that you recorded it? Um, and the biological rec record uh, recording company actually provide a suite of blogs and resources about how to improve accuracy and data quality when submitting data, and also information on how to use iRecord, which is really, really useful. So I'm sure Kieran can whack some um, links in the chat about that. Um, and iRecord is another useful tool for submitting data for the IVB. Again, it's another, it's one of those species where it can be confirmed from photographs and you can just put your photograph with your record details on iRecord or on a, on the Bees, Wasps and Ants Facebook group. Um, and you will get people basically telling you whether you've got an IVB or not. And then you can take that data and then you can submit it to Bees, Wasps. Um, and please, please, if you're interested in this um, and you all seem to be, um, then come and submit this data because it's really helpful for, for people like me, researchers doing, doing this, this research and monitoring species. Um, and finally, I, I just want to say we often hear a lot about insect decline and it is true that many species are threatened with local, regional, national extinction. And this is because of a perfect storm of climate change and habitat loss, intensive agriculture and urbanization. But there have actually been more bees colonizing Britain over the past 30 years than have been lost from Britain over the past century, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Um, and that's because of the climate. It's because the climate and the landscape of Britain changes over time, and there will always be winners and losers. Um, species who either fail to adapt to a new set of environmental, environmental circumstances or opportunistic species which are able to thrive and expand their range. Um, and the IVB is the perfect case study of a winner, of a winning species who has been able to take advantage of a warmer autumn and a lack of competition for forage and has become one of the most well-known bees in Britain, despite only being here for 20 years. So a little bit to think about. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this talk and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.